Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Sophie Hackett, the Curator of Photography here at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and it is my great pleasure this afternoon to be in conversation uh, with the great Martha Rossler. Um, I will introduce her uh, in just a moment, but first I want to acknowledge that the AGO operates on the land that is the territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and also the territory of the Wendat and Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the Federal Government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the Credit Anishinaabe Nation. Toronto has always been a trading center for First Nations. So with me today, the great Martha Rossler, uh, who in a career spanning uh, a number of decades now, since the late 1960s, uh, works in video, photography, text, installation, and performance. Her work focuses on the public sphere, exploring everyday issues from, sorry, exploring issues from everyday life and the media to architecture and the built environment, especially as they affect women. Rossler has for many years produced works on war and the national security climate, connecting life at home with the conduct of war abroad, in which her photo montage series, of course, has played a critical part. She has also published several books on photographs, texts, commentary on public space, ranging from airports and roads to housing and gentrification. Welcome, Martha. Hi. Uh, before we get started, two further notes for our viewers today. Uh, if you have questions at any point, please use the webinar Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. Uh, and my wonderful colleagues, Kathleen and Annie, will make sure that we see them. Uh, and of course, I would also like to send a big thank you to the TD Ready Commitment, who are lead sponsor of talks and performances. Uh, and thank you for generously sponsoring this talk. So, uh, Martha, the last couple of weeks, it's been a big couple of weeks in American politics, um, to put it mildly. Uh, and I want to just cast back to something you said in an interview in 2017 with uh, the scholar and uh, cultural critic Molly Nesbitt. This is just a mere six months after Trump's inauguration and you remarked, we're talking about politics as if it was still possible. Frankly, democracy may not be possible right at this moment, but we have to act as though it is because we have no choice. How do you think uh, Thinking back on those words, now that the four years of, of the full term have kind of come to pass, how do you think democracy has fared in these in this time? Well, I would still claim that it's not at all clear to me that we are operating under a democratic system. And I would say we're still very tottery, not secure at all. Uh, and we have managed to produce a population that has uh, suffered from the delegitimation of institutions, which makes democracy impossible because democracy depends on a collective agreement that we are governed by rules, laws, and unspoken agreements that allow us to engage in certain forms of governance, decision-making and so on that are agreeable to most. And we are not in that position right now. Do you have a little more hope than you did uh, a couple of weeks ago? For sure but not a lot. Um, if we were a one-off in the world, I would say, well, the United States is just another country and it's losing its uh, purchase on democratic structures, but we're part of a wave of authoritarian, illiberal, and frankly, fascist governance that is um, only growing stronger. I don't want 
to be pessimistic, but I do want to have some kind of realistic grip on historical trends. Does making your work help to think through or face this reality that we're in at the moment? And, and maybe if you'd say a few words about how, how you have worked through the last four years in the US. I think I'm like everybody else, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's captured our imagination, our uh, fears, it's personified our terrors and uh, concretized them, but also served as a metaphor at the same time that we live or we're living in a sea of both misinformation and disinformation. And I would say like so many people, I experienced the last year as being immensely long, but also lacking continuity. So aside from the ravages of the disease, there's the problem of trying to cope with a constant stream of crazy making outrageous and incendiary comments from the guy who's supposedly in charge of the executive. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like nothing we've lived through really. Um, you mentioned the sort of systems of information and disinformation and the systems through which which are, uh, of course, you're speaking about the media, the media systems there, but it, of course, links, I think, quite nicely back to um, the work that has brought us to have a conversation, uh, to start a conversation today, which is a work you made back in 1974-75 called The Bowery into Inadequate Descriptive Systems. Um, and systems is very much in the, in the title there. Um, this exhibition, this uh, work is actually on view in an exhibition uh, in our permanent collection galleries for photography, went up in October, uh, just a couple of weeks before we had to shut down again. So hopefully we'll uh, be able to welcome visitors back sooner, sooner than later. Um, but this work uh, was looking at this moment, the 60s and the 70s, these decades, uh, and how new photographic practices were emerging um, and kind of building on, um, I, think a, I think a greater, pushing for, I think for a greater range of um, approaches or um, expressions of an idea of documentary to some, to some degree. And we can, can, that term is a very contested one. We can have a whole, you know, a symposium on that. I don't want to go too far down that road, but I just want to explain the context in which your work is being presented. Uh, and it's a very kind of international story, trying to make that story a broader story. It's been very uh, dominated by the UK and the US. So we want to kind of think about it in a broader form. But I will share my screen right now so people can see, those who don't already know this work can see um, what it in fact <clears throat> looks like on the wall. Uh, so here it is, 45 gelatin silver prints that are presented in this grid format. Uh, and as, of course, you can see, there are uh, individual images, uh, uh, photographs of storefronts on the Bowery, accompanied by text. And I will um, just forward here to some of the, uh, just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, and then, of course, here, a detail of two of the panels. Um, when, so when you made this work, Martha, so really roughly 50 years ago, it was another moment of upheaval and change. So just, just ignore that I used that number. Um, can you talk a little bit about what photography was to you at that moment and what you might have been, uh, uh, to me, it seems like you're reacting against something, though you, you may disagree with that. Um, but what were, if so, what were you reacting against? I would say that I was a kind of um, indignant collective rethinking of what photography was um, and trying especially to push against what photography, what, how it was being positioned in relationship to the art world, because that was a moment at which photography was being dragged into the art world, which meant that its 
characteristics as a far more demotic and journalistic medium, not to mention um, familial, uh, were being stripped in favor of a depoliticized, aestheticized approach. It was being museumized. And that meant significant re-narrativization of its history. And uh, again, this is a question that we could spend a long time trying to answer, but if you would say in a brief, a brief way, what in fact is wrong with the, the museumization of the, or was it losing, I suppose, was it losing possibilities in this new narrativization? It was still under the shadow of modernism, which demanded, and modernism in a broad sense, but it pretty much demanded that each art had its own um, fixed characteristics that separated it from all other arts and also that it could not be appetitive in the Kantian sense of demanding action or uh, incorporation uh, in any way other than through the aesthetic faculty. That sounds a little bit arcane, but what it meant was that photography was stripped from its ability to actually be part of a continuum of ways of talking about how to be, how to live, how to make change, or how to critique. Right. So you're talking about the, the dictates of medium specificity, uh, and perhaps yeah. also that... Um, the fourth wall. Right. Um, and that whatever, whatever is worth paying attention to is, is within the frame, within the frame of the image. Fourth wall. Roughly. Yeah. It was being aestheticized and formalized, which are not characteristics that should be or can be ignored, but mm -hmm. when they are the sole criteria for acceptance and a specific insistent that all incident be absent from photography worth looking at that put pretty impossible strictures on documentary. Right. And particularly a documentary tradition from the 30s say that that had a, um, well, that aimed to create a set of point out, it was forged out of a political consciousness in, in some way. Or at least though I wouldn't put myself in that tradition, saw itself as part of a grand humanistic endeavor mm -hmm. to reform the world. And it was exactly against that, that John Sharkovsky, who was the most important photo critic in North America at the time, uh, and that includes, of course, both Mexico and Canada, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art. He very specifically set out to do that in his new documents show of 1967, where one can still read what he thought this kind of photography should be, which is essentially representing a somewhat ineffably outlined personal vision. So, Thank you for laying that out. So that's what you're pushing against. We see here two of the details and we have others from the larger piece. Um, you've indicated that when you were, when you made this work, that in some cases you have a work that, um, you know, kind of evolves over, over time, but that in the case of this work that you in fact had a plan. Uh, in fact, you said a plan, a grid and an arc uh, that satisfied you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that um, and maybe take us through your process um, in well, creating it? I thought it should represent a walk down the, the Bowery, though actually it was up the Bowery, that it shouldn't privilege any particular images and that it needed to be tied to text. And, mm -hmm. um, the trajectory that eventually came about was in terms of <clears throat> in terms of the language that it went from 
a series of light adjectives and nouns about drunks and drunkenness to rather more severe and uh, uh, more heavily freighted words. These things emerged, but I knew I wanted it to be a grid. Uh, I knew that it wanted to actually have a linear movement, though people wouldn't know that if they didn't know the street itself. And I don't know that anyone's actually taken time. But I also want to point out that there's no question that it has trails of pop and Ed Ruscha with his effort to document, you know, every house on Sunset, every building on Sunset Strip or whatever. That is to create a compendium, but not one that has a fairly impassive and implacable nihilism, but rather one where I plucked that idea of a certain um, fullness, though I wouldn't claim in any way that it's every building, obviously. Um, and try to repurpose it in a different conceptual direction. In the case of the of the photographs of the storefronts, uh, the Bowery still at this time was a well known. Uh, the word you've used is Skid Row, um, where and where men mostly men would congregate. They often. Um, you can see here, for instance, uh, in the upper image, there are an empty bottle. Um, so uh, alcohol was one of the pastimes, we could say. Um, why is it that no people feature in the photographs? No actual calling, human figures, I, I should say. Calling on the metonymy of photography, which is a cut in the world. And I thought, well, I will show, I will remove the main subject of that cut and just have the setting uh, because I didn't want it to become pictures of people. I wanted it to be a work that addressed, how should I put it, Emilia, but perhaps more importantly, a picture of Emilia in images, but then to cross cut that with a somewhat different set of linguistic frames. And why was the text, you mentioned earlier that the text was, you, need, you knew it needed to be text-based or anchored in text. Why was that important? Um, really? I think one of the things that I wanted to lean on was that documentary photography itself has never existed as an image, but rather an image embedded in language. It's always been embedded in either caption or text. And even though I was violating the idea of the caption, nevertheless, if you're looking at photographs, you, and they're not in an art gallery or uh, randomly presented in somebody's house or whatever, they're going to be embedded with a text or in text, descriptive element. Right. You've talked about, so the, you mentioned that the, the words that we see, they are either adjectives or nouns that describe the state of drunkenness and, and it's, uh, in its range, uh, because we do go from words like tipsy to um, words that are more like dead soldier or comatose. Um, You've referred to this, to the text, or the words really, um, as a poetics of drunkenness. Um, and you mentioned, um, you mentioned captions or you mentioned the sort of, the text that might accompany a photo essay, which would have been very familiar to viewers um, at the time that you created this work. Um, why the poetics or why go against it or violate it in that way? Again, I wanted to move away from any kind of specificity or anything relating uh, concretely to what you're looking at, which is the storefront. It's a soundtrack, in effect, that emanates from that which is absent, which is not specific people, but 
a community of English speakers? Some of the words are certainly words that are very familiar, like as I mentioned, the word tipsy or even um, tippler, uh, but others are more, uh, I don't know, less uh, unknown to me, Lushington, for instance, uh, <laughs> which is somebody named Lushington, which no. <laughs> um, well, this, I asked people to give me words for drunken drunkenness and um, uh, you have a picture of my notebook, but I also went to a rhyming dictionary, I mean, a historical slang dictionary and went back to English uh, rhyming slang or just street slang because I wanted to have uh, a cut in time in a different way from the way photography makes its cuts in time. Yeah, and I think by that it sort of, it casts the well, the reader in this case, uh, back in time, in fact, rather than forward in time. So it gives it that sense of, sort of emphasizes that sense of pastness somehow. Um, of course, in the title there, you, you mentioned two inadequate descriptive systems. And of course, those are the photographic image and the written language or the words that appear in each panel. Um, what is inadequate about these systems? Well, there are efforts at representation of experience, the experience of human beings, and per force, they are inadequate to represent our experience, which may still be based in language and image internally, but is never cut into little pieces and plastered on a wall or in a book or even in language itself. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that uh, combined in the way they are, are they more inadequate or less inadequate? I think it's really hard to answer that. You, you mean language or and images or these images and that language or any pairing of language and I'm serious, I mean, that, mm -hmm. I'm not, being playful, I'm serious about that. I guess I think if I think about the photo essay, let's say a photo essay in Life magazine, which would have again been a very familiar form to people at the time you made this work. I think about that combination of text and image as such a solid one that the image is there, you can see it and give some, have some sense of experience of a place or a person. And we can again debate that, but uh, the text then tells you what's there to know. Um, so it's such, a, it's such a, I think a strike on almost concrete combination, uh, really hard to move away from once you see those two things together. So I guess the question in this way, the, the fact that it's not full sentences for perhaps leaves it a bit more open and therefore, um, the meaning is less sure. Um, so I suppose the adequacy can go in either direction, whether it's if you want surety, it's probably more inadequate. If you want less surety, less and more poetry, it's perhaps more accurate. That was beautiful. <laughs> um, I think, you know, one of the reasons I use video is because um, it, inevitably puts less emphasis on a, uh, a moment of time stuck on a pin for contemplation, though there's always the value of, you know, doing that even extended in video, you know, letter to Jane by Godard, for example, you know, to read an image over an extended period of time. Um, but the, this, the, pictures are not illuminated by those words. Those pictures are not illuminated. And I say illuminated, there's the only image, there are only two images, I think, maybe three that actually 
go with the text. Otherwise, I kind of didn't care which texts were with which image when they're when it's reproduced. I, I cared when I put it together because there is a flow of intensity. But you won't know that if you're just looking at two or three of these. Right. But um, the image, the words themselves are groupings of metaphors, such as nautical ones or industrial ones. And so they pull against a picture of the storefront. But the ones that say out like a light, for example, there are a lot of lighting stores and still are on the Bowery. Uh, so I wanted to pick a picture of a lamp store for that. But that's my little joke. And also dead soldiers, dead Marines. It's the only reference to the fact that we were in an outrageous war, but that means empty bottles. But I think those are words mean empty bottles, but I think it's inevitable that people will think about dead winos or you know dead Bowery denizens or however, whatever stereotype you wanna characterize them as. Uh, in other words, the words pull you away from the pictures. And I do want to point out that the caption that you have says, says 45 gelatin silver images, but what it is is 45 um, gelatin silver images on 24 black boards. And the reason that that matters is that they're actually missing the first three pictures. There are no it actually starts with text on a blackboard with, without a pair, without pairing work. And that was, again, to say this may be fundamentally a work about documentary, that is documentary photography, but let's step away from the subject for the moment and think about what other subject might be going on here. There is so much about the way the work is presented that's very, um, well, we can say serious or earnest. It is a grid, it's in black and white. It's, uh, it confronts you, you need to read, um, you need to think about the relationship of the parts. Um, and yet there, there seems to me, and I would love your thoughts on this, that there are moments of humor. I mean, you talked about your own sort of inside joke about the lights out and the lighting store. Although to me, actually, that's less about a joke and more about a kind of his historical and sort of urban specificity um, at that moment, perhaps. But I, there, are, there are moments of levity. There are, there are words that seem funny. Uh, and I wondered if that was intentional. Yeah. You named one, Lushington. I mean, that is a ridiculous word. But like I said, I actually had a friend named Lushington. But stuccoed, you know, just the words that we actually use, they're meant to be humorous when we say he's nozzled or he's, you know. Fried to the hat. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> they um, are the poetry of a certain kind of knowing despair. Whoops. Why, it's my son. I think I will. Turn my phone off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this, is, this is our moment. Um, okay. So you talked about it being the, the poetry of a certain... Um, a knowing community mm -hmm. of either exaltation or despair, but mostly despair when you say that someone's down with the fish. It's not a positive thing. Right. The, um, I think my next slide is in fact, oh, okay. So you've often um, gone back and revisited places, uh, revisited works and, and reformulated them. Uh, you've, and you've often said, or very clearly said that this work is uh, not about the Bowery per se, <laughs> uh, even though it, it, it is, depicts certain places and the words are linked to a community that's there. Um, you've often uh, also said that really it is uh, in fact about, well, these systems, how photographs and words in fact uh, can contain and, and shape our experience. 
nonetheless, you do pay attention and keep track of uh, how the urban scape changes. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight here um, a couple of the views and how the how it has changed over time, really over between 74, 75 and 2008. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add about that? Yeah, that was when I was asked to make a work about the Bowery for <laughs> the opening of the new museum, gentrifying museum, yes. as yes. well new. Uh, they gentrified Broadway and then they gentrified the Bowery the first time they were ashamed, the second time they just threw their hands up. Right. That's, that's life. <laughs> and it did result, uh, we don't have uh, images or a clip of it here, but it did result in video work that you called Bowery Highlights. And you actually went back and sort of addressed the place itself, not simply the exactly. modes of photography and the image. Well, the, the Bowery into inadequate descriptive systems gave me the opportunity to talk about a place that was a hunting ground for photographers uh, in terms of the photographs they were after. Um, but Bowery Highlights was about real estate. Mm -hmm. I'm just showing an image here that might be um, typical. Marjorie Collins is perhaps, uh, there are, there are many other examples, but she um, in fact trained with the Photo League, so she would have come with a certain other kind of education, um, but made this for a government agency um, as, as part of the Bowery. So this, and there are so many pictures you can find of individuals who are sleeping on the street and it's kind of become a, the convention of photographing the Bowery and over decades, even into the 1970s where there's quite a well-known book by Mark Zettler called The Bowery. Yes, I wrote about it in the essay that I was strong armed into writing <laughs> by a certain person working in Canada at the time. Uh, this the book was work is 74, 75, but the book was published by Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Right, in 1981, and that was Benjamin Buchlow, um, the, the essay being in and in around and afterthoughts. On documentary photography. Yeah, um, great piece of writing. But a lot of people think that the essay either is the work or is part of the work, but the essay is quite separate from the work and many years later, but I certainly can understand why in people's mind they see them as um, of a piece, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't mind, I'd like to just read a, a quick uh, excerpt from that uh, essay, in fact. Um, which I think brings us back to the, the general ideas you were talking about earlier. So you write the Bowery in two inadequate descriptive systems is a work of refusal. It is not defiant anti-humanism. It is meant as an act of criticism. The text you are reading now runs on the parallel track of another descriptive system. There are no stolen images in this book. What could you learn from them that you didn't already know? per this image, for instance, in the convention of photographing sleeping um, men on the street. Right. If impoverishment is a subject here, it is more centrally the impoverishment of representational strategies tottering about alone than that of a mode of surviving. Um, I love that sentence. <laughs> to, uh, to think about medium specificity as something that is tottering about alone or an image um, makes me laugh. Do yeah. you still think that holds true? What, that representational strategies totter about alone? <laughs> uh, or that the, the impoverishment that you're addressing in the piece is still about the impoverishment of um, representational strategies? That late modernism foisted on us, yes. Mm -hmm. So I have to say it wasn't just late modernism. I mean, Paul Strand himself imposed the who I think is a great wonderful photographer and doesn't fit the um, the mold let's put it that way um, the mold of self-absorption uh, he what he did was he yanked Stieglitz uh, out of the pictorialist moment and into the moment of modernism in photography so 
we can say that it was a necessary move toward some of the precepts of photography as photography, uh, or you could say photography as X, but not as painting. So the ideas that you start that you start to explore in the Bowery work, um, of course, you deal with the state of photography, you deal with the state of documentary, you deal with the state of uh, the possibility of, shall we say, art to make change, or at least to open up a space for more than what the dominant forces are. Um, the dominant culture is insisting upon. Um, I wanted to highlight here a work that uh, something that you started in 1989, so a project called If You Lived Here um, that was created for the DIA Foundation. Um, we have a few images here, but you wanna talk about how the strategies that you use, they're similar in some ways, but also different and how this piece sort of builds on the Bowery, what you were thinking about in the Bowery. Uh, that's pretty complicated. Let me see which strand I'll start with. First of all, I want to point out that many people who ask me, who write to me and ask me questions about the Bowery or who write about the Bowery without asking me, but I see it, uh, refer to it as a work about homelessness. The men on the Bowery were not homeless. They were living in hotels, single room occupancy or SRO hotels, which lined the Bowery, which is why they were there drink in the bars during the day, uh, pay for the DOS uh, at night. And they were cheap lodgings and um, gentrification got rid of those hotels. And now we have homeless people instead. Um, I was living in California um, for most of the 70s, though I was living in New York for a period uh, in 74. Uh, I put the words and the, the work together in California in 75, which is why it has two dates on it. But I moved back to New York in, uh, from actually Vancouver, which surprised even me that I would leave mm -hmm. paradise. This is pre-gentrified Vancouver um, in 19, late 1980. And I was completely shocked by seeing people sleeping in the streets. And I also did a lot of gigs as a visiting artist. And what I discovered through the 80s was that in many of the cities I visited, artists were making work about homelessness, but nobody in New York, in the art world at least, would even dream of making work about homelessness because no one would show it. Um, I did a large project in Colorado uh, uh, that was anti-nuclear and anti-war and it had many, many parts and pieces and homemade maps and performances with students and a library and all kinds of stuff. When I was invited to show a DIA, it was on the basis of that show, which is called Fascination with the Game of the Exploding Historical Hollow Leg, <laughs> Rossler titles. And it was from 1983. And then it occurred to me that it was idiotic that I would be making all the work when I had seen so much work outside New York. So people have referred to the show, If You Lived Here, as being about New York, but actually it's not. <laughs> but it's about New York and many other places, but there were a lot of New York artists and as your text has video and filmmakers, adv activists, advocates. So um, I got together with a guy named Dan Wiley who was a student in the Whitney Independent Study Program where I was teaching because he was working on very similar themes which was gentrification and the rights of the city. And uh, he uh, helped me uh, make connections with particularly um, advocacy groups in Harlem. And uh, we put together uh, works, um, contributions. We also put it from activist groups and said, we'll help you make a work if you would, would like to join, but don't know how to do it or don't feel confident. And 
uh, we put out a call for DIA for artists and particularly photographers. Though the one rule that I had was no photos of people lying on the street. And you can see in of the six photos at the bottom behind the woman on the chair, there's a photo of a man lying on the street. But actually what that is, is a photo of a park bench of the students of Robbie Canal in LA who did um, posters that they put on the back of park benches uh, or street benches that said LA's official uh, project for the homeless, meaning it itself is a quotation of somebody lying on the street and has nothing to do with being a representation of a guy lying on the street. And I also have to point out that it was a white guy, but which was not true of uh, the people on the Bowery in New York were mostly uh, African-American when I was doing that photographing. So it consisted, I also realized that it couldn't be one show, it had to be three shows because otherwise I would be falling into the liberal trap of saying pity, 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 homeless, pity, pity, pity. So the first show was called Home Front and it was about people fighting to keep their homes. The second was called Homeless and the third was called City Visions and Revisions, which was about architecture real and fanciful in the idea of remaking cities and habitations. And each of them had a slogan. The first was from the mayor. If you can't afford to live here, move. If you can't afford to live here, move. And the second that was, was Ed Koch. Ed Koch. Uh, homelessness exists not because the system isn't working. I'm going to get this is a paraphrase, but because this is the way it works, which is a quote from Peter Marcuse. Mm -hmm who was teaching at Columbia and was Dan Wiley's professor. And the third, City Visions and Revisions, was the situationist slogan from 68, a crushingly popular one under the cobblestones, the beach, um, which is about the imagination and um, like-minded, like, so. Yeah, so there were a lot of participants in these shows and a lot of work. And there were four public forums. Wow. The, uh, there's such a deliberate giving over of um, space. There seems a deliberate non-insistence on a sort of singular authorship. Though you were invited to do the show, you quite quickly um, gave it away, if we can say, to work with that many artists. Um, do you feel, I don't know, and you continue to work in, in, in a, in this similar way in, in current pieces. Yes, they, you've got um, current work, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me just take a deep breath there. The, uh, it's a way that you continue to work. Yeah. Um, and what, what is the value about that? Um, then maybe in, in, in 1989, when you were doing this, what, um, what seemed right about it? It seemed obvious in 1989 that if I was seriously interested in any kind of exploration of art interventions and um, other utterances about homelessness, it didn't make sense for me to try and make them all, but um, to have to draw on the wealth of material that hadn't been seen, particularly in New York, and also to have serious conversations with people and to have an actual library um, and to have flyers and historical material and uh, work by school children um, because this was a conversation that was desperately needed. Um, and it just was absurd for me to be anything other than a facilitator. Uh, I subsequently found out that this was a radical idea. It's not a radical idea, it's an obvious idea. But for the New York art world, it was anathema, in fact. But. Hmm. 
we keep going here. Um, another sort of public project in this case, using this idea of um, homelessness and engaging, you know, Times Square being a kind of uh, well, a spectacular space in so many ways. Um, did this grow of um, the prior? You froze. If you, uh, if I still live, it was a. Oh. Can you hear me? Am I back? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. So this okay. was an entirely uh, separate invitation by the public art fund that had no idea what I was doing. And I thought, great, I'll make an animation. Mess their section, their project was called Messages to the Public. This was the public art fund before it became wedded to spectacularization. Though you could say that artists on billboards was a pretty new thing and certainly a moving billboard. I mean, this is not digital. There are light bulbs going on and off and it was pretty primitive, but uh, I thought it was important to, to do. Is there an aspect, uh, if I maybe just go back one moment to, oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. And I can't get back, apologies. Wait, naked ladies, we're not talking about <laughs> I know, how are we not? I'm sorry, I have to go just uh, back for a moment. Is there um, just, just something like this? I think about you know, the way you talk about this the kind of collaborative project as a sort of obvious way of working. Um, there's something, I suppose it would be leveled as a criticism uh, to call something didactic, um, but I wonder, uh, well, by those in, if, if you imagine someone entrenched in the art world um, and you mentioned somebody thinking this is a radical idea, um, is there something about the way you organized space or the way that you created space for the, the visitors that came to the exhibition or even the participants in the show that, that you would call uh, aesthetic? And is there a sort of maybe an aesthetics of didacticism in some of this? The answer could be no, but I was just- Well, we did our best to make it uh, welcoming and to have places for people to sit and there were TVs and couches and there was like a uh, little living rooms with uh, rugs um, for a number of the photos the guy they hired to do the installation shots he removed the TVs because TVs are not aesthetic think about that think about an art world uh, in which TVs are not aesthetic and that's the consideration for taking an installation shot of a show. There were 30 videos in every show. Mm. Is, um, but uh, not to knock on him, he did what he was told to do. But there was also Homeward Bound, um, which you've pictured here, asked to have an office and uh, in the gallery. They wanted to be in the gallery. so we opened the library space and made a shelter of beds uh, on the other side of the library, uh, put the books along the edge, but you see their office and that's some friends, uh, some participants and friends of Homeward Bound. There were no children, in fact, in the people who sat in this 100 days, more than 100 day vigil, but they were very enthusiastic about being able to run workshops and you can see them running a workshop in that shelter space uh, and to be on the panel and they were often in the news in fact and somebody wrote a book about them that's quasi fictionalized called Sleeping with the Mayor because it is in front of City Hall in City Hall Park. Uh, so they were um, one group of participants in the shows Though so primarily though, uh, Dan and I met with them quite regularly, but this was their actual physical presence. And then there was also the Madhousers who um, came up from Atlanta to build huts um, as a, a kind of a, both serious, but also, um, a poke in the eye kind of intervention in public space. 
Makes me think of a, a local carpenter who's actually started making tiny houses for the uh, those currently living in Toronto city parks. Um, it's uh, it I recalled it immediately. Um, I'm just a little conscious of time, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, we at least give our viewers a glimpse of. Uh, the extraordinary range and inventiveness and commitment of the work that you've created uh, throughout your career. So I'm going to move on from this uh, and housing is a human right. Um, this is related to a question that I maybe we'll come back to. Um, but one of anyway, we'll come back to it. So uh, we're going back in time again, even actually to before a time before uh, the Bowery was created uh, to a series of photo montages that uh, you made, you still make, in fact. Um, this has to do here, it's a series called Body Beautiful or Beauty Knows No Pain. This is the full series of them. Um, you're working primarily with magazine material, correct? Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorites. Um, Hot House or Harem after Angra, so really taking up, challenging, in fact, um, the way women's uh, bodies, appearances, um, the expectations of, of appearance um, were kind of, I suppose, foisted on or encouraged through um, seduction and other means. Um, though this work uh, looks very different from the Bowery in its, um, Kind of in its final form, there are, would you talk about the, um, perhaps the systems you are trying to undo here? Well, this is we'll reform. about the formation of the ideological positioning of women uh, and who they are and what, what function they serve as household appliances of one kind or another. Uh, and I would say the same, why there are no pictures of men on the Bowery because we already know how to read pictures of men on the Bowery. We know who they are. They are the ultimate alien other. And so are women. Speaking of, I guess uh, you referred to, to women as household, household appliances and the, you know, we're, we're going through this quickly, but I want to give, leave some time for questions. Um, in a different way, thinking about possessions and household possessions, um, you staged in um, 1973, actually, when you were in California, at UC San Diego, a garage sale um, called the Monumental Garage Sale. In the art gallery. Yeah, in the art gallery. Talk to us about why it was important to do this in an art gallery. Because um, it was a, a based on ultimately a comparison of systems evaluation to say, how do we know what things are worth? And what is it that lends things value by having them in an art gallery as opposed to in somebody's yard? Uh, of course, no, but, and I also was well aware that nobody would even stop and think about that for one second, but I did wind up having uh, an argument with um, the father of Peter Marcuse, that is Herbie Marcuse Herbert, who actually was a friend of mine for whom this was the ultimate desecration of the whole idea of art as a space of liberation, but I felt that the idea of art as a space of liberation was a mistake, that it was over. That's modernism now. And this is in MoMA where I didn't want to do it, but I did it. Um, and you've restaged it. There was, of course, I put up a list of different places it's occurred, you know, in more than a dozen times in different cities around the world. Um, here you get to call it the Meta Monumental Garage Sale. Um, and I was struck by your description of, uh, I guess, the people who might attend, um, who are attending the garage sale are not necessarily even aware of or interested in the art gallery context at all. And um, even at MoMA, <laughs> I wouldn't allow the curators or the museum to have a gloss that explained why is this here? So people, uh, it was during the Christmas shopping period. People 
periodically came up and said, who's running this? I want to complain. And I'd say, well, you can complain to me. <laughs> I'll take your complaint. And what were they complaining about? They didn't like the price or one of the people, my surrogates didn't sell it to them or, you know, they didn't like the interaction. Hmm. Um, so you've got a number of portraits here of people with their, with their stuff, with their garage sale spoils. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I, I somebody asked me when I was giving a talk in Poland, didn't I feel contempt for these people? Are you kidding? No, I felt joy. I, was, I thought it was great if people bought things that made them happy. Yeah, customer satisfaction. Sure. <laughs> um, and is that Gail Buckland in one of these pictures? Who? Gail Buckland. I don't know, yeah. but that's okay. Uh, I forget his name right now. Mike, way up at the top. Of Yes, so lots of artists and stuff showed up, of course. Yeah, more yes. It's so great. <laughs> uh, and of course, you created a yeah, newspaper. Yeah. Which were the newspapers were serious, serious works, which meant that MoMA hated them. Absolutely hated them. Why? They said they were Marxists. <laughs> In 2012? Seems. Okay. No, the enemy. They wow. also said that it was the director and chief curator said, well, we know this is a critique of us. And I'm going, mm, I've done this 12 times and you think this is a critique of you. Okay. And I said, well, not really which is true, the same way the pictures of the Bowery aren't really about, you know, national cash register and so on. It's more like it's staged here, but no, they were sure it was a critique of them. Well, and I think there are sort of, perhaps, would you say that there are roots to this, uh, well, the garage sale came before the semiotics of the kitchen, in fact. That's right. <laughs> but I'm still the same me. Uh, this, of course, short video Next piece. I'm as the Bowery, right? Yes, that's yeah. right. Um, so I'm, I'm really struck by the different way, how you're ranging around, how you're presenting and representing uh, the same ideas that you're ideas. working with. Pardon me? The same old ideas. <laughs> But playfully, well, here, I suppose this is maybe a less playful moment, K for knife. Uh, those not familiar with the piece, of course, in the six minutes, uh, Martha uh, sort of narrates, goes through the alphabet, uh, naming um, objects in the kitchen. So uh, it's a uh, play, it's, again, has that mix of, I think, seriousness, but also playfulness. Um, Children now. love this work. I'm Why do you serious. think? Because and, primitive, they get it. It's no problem for them. Take a knife, <laughs> stab the knife, hit the table, with, whack it with something, sure. Right. Why not? Right. So great to see the garage sales sort of in, paired with this in a, in a way as a precedent and good context. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting to the end here, and I, I just want to, you know, one of the a project that's been ongoing for you since the '80s is, of course, airports. You are you spend a lot, have spent a lot of time in airports, although probably uh, not since you were uh, last here, which was March of last year. You yes, were in Toronto last, for a conference. My last trip was to Toronto. Uh, so it's strange to think of these as entirely empty and pretty useless spaces to us at the moment. Though uh, perhaps that will. But this that will work. change when this is a work about itinerant labor, my itinerant labor and everybody in the art world. This is where we work, but <laughs> it's about the site and the experience of the labor yeah. and other people's labor. So I'm but also through these quite quickly. Photography but... and go ahead. The way that cameras see color, for example, um, which, you know, all the printers on these used to say, you know, you could color correct these. Yes, I could. I could. I could do that. 
and an installation from your recent retrospective at the Jewish Museum called Irrespective, um, which I did not get to see, sadly. Um, but I want to move ahead to something that's maybe more of a work in progress. It doesn't even have a title at the moment, and we thought we should end with a bit of levity before taking a well, couple of questions. Air, it's called the airfare. <laughs> I love it. Um, what are we looking at here? Dinner. <laughs> when they serve dinner. <laughs> the, uh, maybe a site that we're not so eager to see. Talk about it. Also, there's an inherent class comparison because um, by the time I reached a certain age, I would say, you want me, you're paying business class, which means you wind up with what's on the lower left as opposed to what's on the lower right. The other, I guess the two yes. on the left versus the two on the right. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely, definitely about value and value. So maybe uh, I'll take, I have a couple of questions here, uh, Martha, for you. Um, maybe I'll start, uh, I'll start with the first here, which is asking about challenges. So what challenges do you see photography uh, facing to address our current sociopolitical moment, especially online? Uh, well, photography doesn't have challenges because photography is not a person. Um, I don't think, first we know that photography has returned to its evidentiary status, so we can say more so video, in that it's completely, because we've become, so there was a moment when people said that photographs could be photoshopped and they didn't mean anything, but I knew that people didn't mean that. They would say that, but we believe photographs. We can't help believing photographs because we are primitive. So we look at a picture of a face, we say that's the face, and then we start reading it. You know, oh, look, he's angry, he's sad, she's pretty, she's not, she's uh, whatever she is. Um, she's happy to see us, she's whatever. Um, she's malicious. Uh, so photography is a, a, a technology that is uh, integral to our lives since it uh, hit the world as a uh, roll film in a box that said, you press the button and we do the rest. So it serves to sell us items on Amazon and everywhere else when we can't leave our house. Uh, and so it's embedded further and further into our everyday life. We think about images uh, and naturalize them. But as I said, we've been doing this for a very long time. The question is, how do we read them and how do we develop criticality? And that is the challenge. Um, but we, at this particular moment, if I can define it as the moment of racial uh, reckoning, and the question of inclusion and exclusion and othering, we absolutely rely on documentary as documentation in which we're not interested in the aesthetics, but in what it tells us about the world in a way that's actually gal galvanizing, motivating, and even possibly literally evidentiary. Thank you for that. Um, but also the same old celebrations that Kodak was selling us, how to picture our lives. We've gotten a lot stupider about that, by the way, but it's okay. Or we've returned to that level of unsophisticated stupidity about what the shots mean. Well, that'll be, that'll be for another, another talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, Someone is asking about any, whether you have any advice for women uh, working as artists at the moment, uh, AKA household appliances. <laughs> um, yeah, do your work. Simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I never know how to give anyone advice. I mean, I, I taught for 35 years, but I would, I can only talk to a person, not to a general milieu, you know. Uh, 
um, I support the work of women and others, but also of men. And we can position them as others quite easily. So uh, maybe one more question, unless my colleagues have one more to send me uh, here. So this is more about institutions and specifically art institutions. Um, how do you think art institutions and um, I guess by extension, uh, the work of artists will be changed by the pandemic? That's a big question. Well, that's the inverse of what I usually get asked these days, <laughs> is how can art affect the pandemic? And of course, the answer is who the hell knows? I mean, the one thing that I will say about art is that I'm always overjoyed when I see something that someone's done that I wouldn't have dreamed of in a million years. So I'm looking to see what people can teach me at this extremely fraught moment. I also want to say about women that there are two good things about now, as opposed to say 50 years ago, which is that women are no longer stigmatized as artists for having children. And the other is that that awful hole in the middle of your progress through life between being a young artist and a very old artist is kind of getting leveled out. And, uh, like you could be a 45 year old male artist now. I think you can also be a 45 year old female artist and still be of interest to the art world. Uh, you mentioned being, um, wanting, wanting to see what, what you can learn. Um, you of course mentioned you, you've taught for many, taught for many years uh, and a fellow artist from Toronto, Nina Levitt here, who's also taught for many years, wondered if, uh, how you think about teaching and did it impact your practice? I, I can't answer that question for the simple reason that I um, started teaching while I was still a graduate student. And I think that the idea of, um, uh, it's similar to my interest in documentary in a sense. I'm trying to actually produce representations and narratives about the world that help communicate to other people something that we share or that I think is true or a truer truth or to point to ways, and this to me is very important, I make work that I would say is as if. My work is a gesture that is trying to say, this is easy, it's incomplete, it's a sketch, but you know, you can do it just as well or better. So why not do it? And that has motivated me from the beginning in the classroom and in my work. Sure. Well, maybe that's a good note to end on um, as if we should all work as if. Um, Martha, thank you for your time today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Um, I will go back into the galleries soon, I hope, and look at the Bowery into inadequate descriptive systems with new eyes and certainly great greater context. So. I, I'm only sorry that I don't see images of the other people who are in on this call, but I'd like to thank people for spending some time listening to us. Yes, thank you very much. We've had uh, over 150 people at different moments, so we'll be able to fill you in later on. So have a good evening, everyone. Stay safe. It's snowy, it's cold. Yes, um, and uh, see you in the galleries soon, we hope.